But let's go ahead and get into Darwinism. First, I want to cover the foundational issues quickly again. I did this last night, so I'll go through this quickly, but in case you weren't here last night, if you don't understand the foundational issues, you won't see why any of this makes any difference. Jesus said that Moses wrote of me. And again, Moses lays down the foundation for the gospel message in the first and the third chapters of the book of Genesis. This is where we're told God created a perfect universe. It was perfect. There was no death, no evil, no suffering. Uh, what happened to it? Adam's original sin. Adam's original sin corrupted the perfect creation, bringing on the curse that allowed death, evil, and suffering to enter. That's why we live in a world full of death and suffering today. God didn't make the world this way. Our sin corrupted it. But that original sin separated man from God, requiring that we be redeemed with God. With the first promise of the coming Redeemer given in Genesis 3:15 where the seed of the woman, meaning the, this coming redeemer will be born of a virgin, will bruise the head of the serpent. And that is the foundation for the gospel message. And this is why you see biblical creation under relentless assault in our secular society. They don't have to get you not to know what the Bible says. If you, they can just convince you the Bible's not true and there's no need for Jesus' sacrifice to redeem you with a creator. Dr. Barrick was talking about the global flood. I thought he, he laid out some great biblical evidence for that. And I've got to tell you, the global flood is the linchpin in this whole world view issue. The Bible says that God judged man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. And today we find the outer crust of the earth made up of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. I live up in Flagstaff. We were speaking in California two weeks ago when we drove out of our house that morning as we were leaving, about a mile down the road, there was a dead raccoon in the middle of the road. Someone had run over. That, that's what I said, too, by the way. <laughs> to be honest with you, it's hypothetical. Okay, it's hypothetical. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> well, we came back three days later. The raccoon's gone. Scavengers had already eaten it. I thought for sure it was going to lay there for millions of years, waiting for strata to build up around it so it could fossilize. <laughs> Things have to be buried quickly to be preserved, become fossils. Now, see, the, the, this worldview issue hinges on whether or not there was a global flood. You see, the, the humanistic or secular worldview, which has been taught in our schools as if it were science for the last 50 years, and it's really just their religious interpretation, their belief, it's based on the exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water. They just say, hey, wait a minute, those layers of rock laid down by water didn't form in a flood. No, no, they formed slowly over millions and billions of years as man slowly evolved all on his own without God. And that means, hey, there was no perfect creation corrupted by some original sin that allowed death to enter and separated you from some supposed creator. Any belief that puts death before Adam undermines the gospel message, no matter how well-intended you might think it is. I used to be a theistic evolutionist. That's a, a Christian who tries to blend evolution into the God's word, but that puts death before Adam. I'm not attacking anyone that has been led to believe in one of those beliefs. I'm, I'm here to help you. Just like somebody, praise God, took the time to help me. But remember, the Bible says, in the beginning God created. Jesus says in Mark and in Matthew, man was made since the beginning. The biblical message is man's sin corrupted the perfect creation, allowing death to enter, separating you from God and requiring Jesus' death on the cross to redeem you with, with God. Any belief that puts death before Adam undermines all that. You can't have death before Adam and then Adam's sin bringing death into the world, my friends. So what we're here today to do is to show you, hey, you can drop all those other beliefs. You can just read God's word and believe it. What did Dr. Burke say? If it makes sense, there's no sense in doing anything else, right? So I think I messed up his quote there, but I was trying. 
You know, atheists really understand this well, and they have for a long time. This from American Atheist magazine. Destroy the original sin. And in the rubble, you'll find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means by putting death before Adam, then Christianity is nothing. And he's absolutely right. He's absolutely correct. It's our mistake when we put death before Adam. It's not God's mistake, it's our mistake. No wonder Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? The book of Genesis is foundational. Jesus says so. He says so clearly. And today, 85% of Christian children, 17 out of every 20, leave the church by the age of 20. Because they're going through 16 years of schooling, telling them they evolved without God. No wonder the Bible warns, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beware of man's philosophies. And there are really only two viable philosophies out there. Either God created the world just like he says he did, or the world evolved all on its own, as the secular system teaches. Well, I live in Flagstaff. It's a college town. They do have that group that says, well, maybe we're not here at all. Maybe we just think we're here. <laughs> but as a general rule, I don't pay a lot of attention to these guys because we really are here. And there's only two viable options. And the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So let's do what the Word of God tells us to do. You know, operational science is knowledge derived from the study and testing of observable, repeatable, testable evidences. Things have to be there so you can test, study, and observe them for them to be true science. Um, operational science has led to many great improvements in our lives, from cars to airplanes to space shuttles to penicillin to laptops to projectors. Real science, things you can test, study, and observe. There's also historical science, and a lot of biology and geology today are historical sciences, where you take things you can observe today and try to extrapolate the, the results onto things you can observe from the past. Dr. Burke talked about uniformity at the end, uniformitarianism. That's what, that's what that's talking about, and that's a historical science. But operational science, things you can test, study, and observe, that, that's our best friend. Now, see, for the last 50 years, kids have been taught it's, that Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, and it started out as a hot ball of rock. And then oceans formed as it rained on the rock for millions of years of time. Well, I like to kid evolutionists, because they'll say to me, you've probably heard this, oh, so you believe your invisible God created the world. And I say, you believe we evolved from a wet rock. <laughs> right? The Big Bang, a big rock formed, it rained on the rock. You're sitting there with this wet, sterile rock. Where did we come from? Yeah, they believe we came from this wet rock. And if you point this out to them, it starts making them realize, hmm, maybe I do have a religious belief here. But see, they've been taught this is science. Who saw the Big Bang? Who observed the big rock form? Who saw it rain on the rock? These are all beliefs. That's not science. None of this is science. This is a belief on how we came about. Again, prove all things. What about the scientific law of biogenesis? Real science, a believer's best friend. The law of biogenesis is a principle of real biology, and what it says is life only comes from life. In other words, non-life, like a sterile, wet rock, cannot produce life. Life only comes from life. So how do Darwinists get life started? Well, they, first of all, they're going to say that Darwinism has nothing to do with the start of life. Why not? Because there's no way to start life without life. But here, this textbook tries to get around the issue. Kids, kids, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended, stated as a fact, from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. How's a kid supposed to argue with that? They've just been told this is a scientific fact, right? Well, what evidence do they have? Well, it says right here, no traces of those events remain. 
I thought science was knowledge derived from the observation of evidence. From the Big Bang to the start of life, they've got no evidence. It's a religious belief. Since they say we start out as a little simple single cell something or another, let's take a look at a bacteria cell just quickly. They're run by tiny molecular motors. Biochemistry and, and bio... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, chemists have found that these cells are run by tiny molecular motors called bacterial flagellum. Now these mo motors, and these are microscopic motors, they allow the cell to swim around and perform functions. They can even change gears depending on how much weight they're towing or pushing. Now they're made up of about 40 different very complex proteins which must be there complete and whole and in the exact order to form the bacterial flagellum at the exact moment life started or life could not have started on its own. It's, they're known as irreducibly complex. That means that if any one of those proteins was missing a piece, if they weren't in the right order, life could never have started. They wouldn't function. And to make matters worse for Darwinism, the process of putting the flagellum together requires other molecular motors that are themselves irreducibly complex. In other words, as real science, a believer's best friend, gets into the genome and into the cell, the more and more complex they are becoming. They are way beyond human comprehension at this point in time and probably always will be. So Darwinists are going to try to get kids to think that they have created life from non-life in labs, that scientists in labs have been able to do it. But if you look closely at their experiments, you'll see actually they've come nowhere near creating life in a lab. Now they've been able to create, think about this, some non-living chemical compounds that are found in life. It would be like you and I creating calcium. And since calcium is found in people, announced into the world, we've created a human being. They've come nowhere near creating life in the lab. The law of biogenesis has never been known to have been violated. Now at NAU, I mentioned last night, they have a class attacking me, primarily because I gave this message here a few times, and they started a class attacking me in biblical creation, and the book they use in that class was written, this is the book they used, written by Eugenie Scott, who is one of the world's most outspoken atheists. She's also the president of the National Center for Science Education. So I thought, well, let's go to the book written by the president of the National Center for Science Education to see how they explain life starting from non-life. And on page 26, here's her explanation. The origin of life was not a sudden event, but a continuum of events with <clears throat> uh, a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. <laughs> so this is the modern college textbook explaining how life started without God. The iffy stuff. And they were making fun of me. Now, I've been married 30 years. That doesn't bother me one iota. So. <laughs> Bill Gates said, DNA is like a computer program, but far more advanced than any software mankind has ever created. The RNA DNA system is way beyond our comprehension. One mathematician and molecular biologist calculated the odds of just one DNA chromosome forming on its own in nature being one in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Now, what kind of number is that? Well, one in 10 to the 50th power is considered absolute zero. One in 10 to the 100 billionth. It would be like if you played the Arizona lottery, and I'm not suggesting that you do, but if you did, your odds of winning the lottery every week 52 weekends a year for 27,000 years in a row would be mathematically better than one DNA forming on its own. In other words, it's a mathematical impossibility, which is why the law of biogenesis has never been overcome. So think about it logically. Millions of scientists building on years and years of millions of other scientists' research with billions of dollars of salaries and computers and lab equipment thrown in cannot make non-living matter produce living matter in a lab in controlled environments. Yet we're supposed to believe that rocks and seawater did it on their own? Oh, but not today when you could test, study, and observe it and show it happening. No, long ago and far away. 
That's not science. That's a religious belief that has undermined scientific research and scientific education. Former Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner George Wall said, modern biologists, having reviewed the downfall of spontaneous generation, that's poof, life starting on its own, yet unwilling to accept creation, are left with nothing. With nothing. We accept the iffy stuff. <laughs> so they've got no way to get life started. So let's let them off the hook there and move ahead to Darwinism. Um, this from Nature Magazine, the most prestigious scientific journal. The origin of animals is as much a mystery as the origin of life. Wait a minute. I thought they had all this supposed evidence. No, it sounds like they've just got more iffy stuff, doesn't it? Let's look at some of this. If you understand the difference between micro and macro evolution, you could win a debate anywhere with a Darwinist, which is why they won't debate anymore, by the way. Um, and in case you don't believe me, I'd be more than happy to debate any ASU, any U professor, or any 10. Up to 10. Up to 20, it doesn't matter. What's 10 times zero evidence? <laughs> zero evidence, right? Now, the word evolution has many different meanings. And so we're going to discuss two, micro and macro. Now, <clears throat> trying to define uh, evolution can be like trying to know jello to the wall sometimes. But let's, let's put this as a definition so we can, we can uh, understand some issues here. Microevolution is just changes within the same kind of plant or animal. So let's just get the word evolution out of there and call these microadaptations. They're, they're just changes within the same kind. You can go down to the pound and get a couple of dogs, a male and a female. Mutts work the best. They have the widest gene pool. And you could breed dogs together for 100 years and take puppies with traits you like and breed those puppies together, and you might end up with a yellow labs and all sorts of things after 100 years. How many non-dogs would you end up with? <laughs> Can I wait? No, no, no. You, you laughed at that because that's a ridiculous thought, right? But that would be Darwinism, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be a macro change, a dog producing a non-dog, like a, a, a penguin, a, a pine tree, or, or whatever it might be. So, in other words, macro change would be a kind producing a different kind. You can breed roses. You can get yellow, red, pink roses. Some do better in Flagstaff. Some do better in, in Phoenix. But roses are only going to produce roses. Dogs are only produce dogs. People are only going to produce people. Kinds will only bring forth after their kind. I could show you a million examples if I wanted to. Here's about 14 right here. Guess how many examples of Darwinian evolution there are that stand up to real science? Zero. There's never even been one viable example found. Well, here's 14 examples of micro kinds bringing forth after their kind. I could show you millions if I wanted to. Hey. Why is it important for Christians to understand that kinds will bring forth after their kind? Because ten times in the book of Genesis, we're told that plants and or animals will bring forth after their kind. And after millions of scientific observations, guess what is found every single time? Kinds only bring forth after their kind. Like the word of God told us ten times in Genesis 1. Think maybe God knew this would be a major point of attack on his word in the last days? Now let me give you a couple of things to think about here. If you will remember this one fact, it'll be another reason Darwinists can never fool you again. Gene depletion, also called genetic entropy. These micro changes within the same kinds or caused by the, think about this, the sorting or loss of the parent's genetic information. In other words, the offspring start out with the genetic information inherited from their parents. Adaptations are caused by the recombination or loss, gene depletion. So the gene pools get weaker and weaker. Now students are given lots of examples of biblically correct micro-adaptations, but then they switch the discussion to Darwinian macro-evolution, and kids are fooled into thinking they've been shown proof of Darwinism, and that the Bible's not true, when really they've been shown the Bible is true, and Darwinists are pulling the old bait-and-switch con game here. 
See, Darwinists focus the discussion on micro, which is biblically correct, because there's no evidence of Darwinian macro to show anybody. Never has been, never will be. Um, Darwin, when he landed on the Galapagos, he made a great observation. He, he counted 13 varieties of finches. I think there's actually 14, but some were black, yellow, thick bill, thin bills. He, he observed micro adaptations, kinds bringing forth after their kind, right? Just like the Bible says. But he jumped to the miraculously erroneous conclusion that somehow, given enough time, the magic ingredient, somehow these changes would lead to improvements and birds would become non-birds. Dogs would become non-dogs. Apes might even become non-apes like humans. So they don't actually teach Darwinism anymore, haven't for years and years, because they had no mechanism to add the new and beneficial genetic information to cause an ape to turn into a person. So they now teach Neo-Darwinism, and this is based on three false assumptions. One, mutations create the new and beneficial genetic information. That's where the information comes from. I cover this in my book, It's About Time, when I'm talking about the 10 top Darwinian beliefs. I cover the mutations, the insertions, deletions, uh, copying errors, duplication errors, Hox gene mutations, human chromosome 2, ERVs, etc. And a nice, just single paragraph, so it's really nice and easy to understand. But then they say, now that the mutations have supposedly added new and beneficial genetic information, natural selection makes a mutant take over the population, leading to Darwinian change, given the magic ingredient, millions of years of time. And this is why a global flood wipes out every old earth belief. You've got to keep that in mind. The flood is a, it's a linchpin. It's a linchpin. But they say, given enough time, a bacteria cell overcomes the law of biogenesis and all mathematical possibility and then mutates its way into everything on Earth, including you and I. And if you want to believe you're the ultimate mutation, that's between you and God. I say we are made in the image of God, just like the Word of God tells us. Here's a problem for neo-Darwinism. After millions of scientific observations... What we find is mutations are also caused by the sorting or loss of the parent's gene pool. Gene depletion applies to mutations just like it applies to adaptations. Now, natural selection is a, is a, is a fact. Uh, if, a, if a creature gets into an environment where it can't survive, it dies. It's that simple. There isn't a selector there that selects it. It just dies because it wasn't... It wasn't created with the information to survive in that condition. Now, that's a process we have labeled natural selection, but I call it God's quality assurance program. I mean, think about it. Things are losing genetic information. They're getting weaker and weaker. If, if they weren't removed from the gene pool, they would corrupt the gene pool. Everything would go extinct in about 1,000 years. Well, what keeps the weaker mutants from corrupting the gene pools? They get too weak. They get removed by... Natural selection. They get into an environment they can't survive and they die. God's quality assurance program. Yet here's a book telling kids how natural selection causes evolution. Natural selection doesn't have anything to do with Darwinism. If it did, it would prevent it. It's God's quality assurance program that keeps his gene pools genetically sound. So, up to the PhD level of science, students are taught that mutations plus natural selection lead to neo-Darwinian evolution. Here is how you scientifically destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Stop your watch. Oh, I'm sorry, that was three seconds. It's a scientific impossibility. This is the reason they can't get over the law of biogenesis. This is the reason they don't have any viable examples to show. It never happened. Yet this Nobel Prize winning scientist said anything we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done. And evidently that includes filling textbooks full of lies, frauds, and misrepresentations of the evidence. Um, in case you didn't notice this, so realize something. He's pushing his religious belief. You see, every human being has a religious belief, whether they admit it or not. If you're an atheist, that's your religious belief. Atheism is one of the strongest religious beliefs out there. You really have to have faith to think everything came about on its own.
So let's look at some of the famous frauds in the textbooks, and I imagine every one of you have seen these when you were in school. This is Ernst Haeckel. He read Darwin's book 10 years after it came out in 1869, and he had the same problem Darwinists have today. He couldn't find any evidence it happened. Well, so he did what Darwinists have become famous for. He invented some evidence, and he came up with the biogenetic law, also called the theory of recapitulation. Kids, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Well, how is a kid supposed to stand up and argue with that, right? What that means is you go through your evolutionary stages while you're in your mother's womb. Now, I'm going to show you his drawings. They go from left to right across the top. These are his drawings, he, and right below are the actual photos, but he's got these things labeled humans, fish, chicken, turtle, etc., right? It was proven in the 1870s. What Haeckel had done was he took a human in the embryonic stage and made a drawing of it, and then he made copies of that drawing and labeled them fish, salamander, turtle, etc., and came up with the theory of recapitulation, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that you go through your evolutionary stages in your mother's womb. Proven fraud in the 1870s and still taught in colleges today. Here's an NAU textbook. I like to use their textbooks because they pick on me. I might as well pick on them, I figure. It's kind of, you know, fair that way. But this is their textbook. It, it tells students whether they develop into fish, amphibians, or humans, vertebrate embryos all start out very similar with gill slits and a long tail. I'm not there in those, those classrooms. Kids are being taught this is a fact. I'm surprised that only 85% of Christian kids are leaving the church. What's wrong with those other 15%? Aren't they paying attention to what they're being taught? Look at this. My friends, you never have gills. You never have gill slits. You have folds in the skin that later develop in the organs in the throat and neck area. They're not gill pouches or gill slits. The NAU book goes on. Oh, in fact, let me say this. You never have a long tail. One of the first things that develops in a human embryo is the backbone. And we, we named the end of the backbone the tailbone. It's not because there was ever a tail there. It's just what we called it. And now the NAU book goes on. Why would humans, think logically, students, why would humans have embryos with gill slits and a tail unless their ancestors also once had these features? And kids' faith is destroyed. I don't know about you, I get mad about it. Mad enough, I'll go to NAU or ASU and I'll put this on in one of their auditoriums. You never had slits or gills. Those are folds in the skin that later develop in the organs in your throat and neck area. We need to get this information to people. Have you heard that you're 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? Proving you're a close relative to the chimp? Well, actually, real science, a believer's best friend, has this down to about 90%. In fact, this one has chimp and human Y chromosomes as much as a 30% difference. A 30% difference? Talk about complexity. You're made up of about 80 trillion cells. And each of your cells' DNA contain 3 billion base pairs of genetic information. Talk about complexity. A 30% difference would require 925 million beneficial information-adding mutations to take place just to change a chimp into a human. And Darwinists can't show you a viable one between bacteria cells and everything in the world that will stand up to scrutiny. If genetic similarity proves our evolutionary past, they should teach kids we evolved from worms. You're 75% the same in your biochemistry as some worms. Like I said last night, you're 50% the same as a banana. <laughs> no jokes today. Okay. <laughs> Can I even ask, did anyone evolve from a banana? Did anyone evolve from a banana? Not even one. Okay. Usually there's somebody. Okay, one. One person. Have you ever heard that uh, uh, bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics or insects becoming resistant to insecticides as proof they're evolving bigger and better? This has nothing to do with the evolution of new kinds with new and beneficial genetic information. 
Let's, let's say I had a thousand cockroaches right here on the floor, and they were running right toward the front row. <laughs> but I sprayed insecticide on them and killed 998, but two survived. Did those two instantaneously evolve an immune system? No, they already had a gene in their gene pool that allowed them to survive. Now, the other 998 either didn't have it or it was switched off, and they died. The two evolved nothing. The information was already there. Now, when they have offspring, their offspring inherit that gene, and the entire population is immune to the poison. They evolved nothing. So why do Darwinists use this as one of their big proofs? Because they've got nothing. They don't have any real evidence. You see, gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Yet this textbook says, hey kids, we have proof of evolution from the fossil record. Well, if Darwinism were true and the, and the strata layers formed slowly over never seen millions of years of time, the, they should be full of, of evidence if it really happened. They show these evolutionary trees of life, and at the, brand, at the bottom they have the word typed in invertebrate ancestor. Well, why don't they show what it was? Well, they wouldn't have any idea what it was. And then someone took a box of crayons, and they drew nice colorful lines from the word invertebrate ancestor to everything on earth, <laughs> and that's supposed to prove everything evolved from the word invertebrate ancestor. Does anyone, thinking about it, does anyone actually see any proof of Darwinism there? No. For each one of those lines to be scientific, they'd have to be made up of millions of transitional fossils as one kind slowly changed into the other. Here we are 150 plus years after Darwin's book came out, and they don't have a single viable missing link of any sort that'll hold up to scientific scrutiny. They only have about four or five they even try to throw out there and fool people with. You know, thousands of creatures are found entombed in amber, and we're told that this amber is up to 250 million years old. Well, things are supposed to evolve over time, right? All the creatures found trapped in amber look just like the living ones today. There's no evidence of Darwinism in the fossil record. This book says, well, Archaeopteryx is the missing link between uh, reptiles and birds. This was found two years after Darwin's book came out. Well, they said, well, Archaeopteryx was about the size of a pigeon and had claws on its wing, proving it's a reptile becoming a bird. Well, the Hoytzin is found in South America alive today. He's about the size of a pigeon and has claws on his wings. No one's saying he's a missing link of any sort. Actually, 20, almost 30 years ago, they found, think about this, they found modern bird fossils below the layer that had Archaeopteryx in it. Now they say that shows their evolutionary past as the layers form slowly. Well, if, if modern birds are there before Archaeopteryx, he couldn't be much of a missing link, could he? And here's a real dagger through this. Reptile DNA doesn't have the genetic information to produce feathers, which are very complex structures. And real science, a believer's best friend, knows of no way for nature to add that kind of genetic information to a gene pool. In other words, it doesn't add up. In fact, now they're starting to say, well, you know, Archaeopteryx, he may not have been a missing link. Maybe he was, he was a feathered dinosaur. He was just a bird. He was a perching bird. An odd bird, but a bird. Have you ever seen the uh, whale evolution series or the camel evolution series, etc.? They're all pretty much the same. Here's the whale series. It shows this extinct land mammal. And then Ambulocetus is the work of art. He's supposed to be the missing link. Here are the bones found. The, the white bones are found in a different strata layer in a different location. They weren't even the same layers or locations, but they put them together and they come up with about 25% of a skeleton. And they say that's the missing link, Ambulocetus. He had no pelvic girdle. They don't know if he ran, swam, flew, or what, but that's the missing link. And then Bacillosaurus is actually 10 times that size. But he wouldn't fit the propaganda if they drew him to size, would he? Hmm. This book says that the, uh, the lobe fin type fish are the missing link between fish and amphibians. And the story goes, the lobe fin couldn't swim, so he walked around on the bottom of the ocean on those lobe fins. I guess one day he got bored, so he climbed out on land and became an amphibian. It's a nice story, but the amphibian has feet, shoulders, elbows, claws. 
skeletal system, a muscular system, a central nervous system, and a different neck system. Nature, science knows no way for nature to add any new and beneficial genetic information, much less the millions of pieces this would have required. And guess what? The lobefin fish, which they thought was extinct for 300 plus million years, is found alive today. And he doesn't walk around on the bottom of the ocean floor. He's a very good swimmer. And the fossilized version that they say is 300 million years old looks just like the living one, with no evolutionary change. Hmm. I always say there's two ways to look at the evidence, so I say either that fish refutes the old earth dating methods and Darwinism, or maybe that scuba diver is 325 million years old. <laughs> You're going to have to make your own choice as to what you want to believe, because there are two ways to look at all evidence. So this appropriately was announced on April Fool's Day in 2006, but this is now one of the messiahs of Darwinism, Tetalic Rosea, and here's when they found it and announced it. Think about what this says. It's still a fish, but exhibiting changes that anticipate the beginning of, of digits, wrists, elbows, and shoulders. Let me reread that. Think about this. It's exhibiting changes that don't even show the beginning, that anticipate some random chance mutation in the future that'll lead to the beginning of wrists, shoulders, elbows. How do you have random chance mutations that anticipate, and this is now one of their messiahs, Tiktaalik. Think about this. Tiktaalik and the fossilized lobe fin fish that we find today have bones exactly like the living lobe fin fish. From the fossilized lobe fin fish to the living lobe fin fish, there's no change in them. So why would we think Tiktaalik's turn into wrists, elbows, shoulders, etc.? And this is one of their messiahs today, this NAU book. And you know, the NAU books are typical of all colleges. Don't, don't think it's NAU, a lot of high schools as well. This NAU book says, look, all these creatures have two bones in the forelimb. From, from a, a human arm, two bones in the forelimb, the wing of a bat, the foreleg of a horse or dog, or a cat, there's two bones in the forelimb, and it says proof they've all derived from a common ancestor. And what do they say the common ancestor that we all evolved from is? The lobe fin fish. Can you believe that? And there's not a shred of change in the lobe fin fish fossils found. My friends, any argument of similarity, whether it be similar bone structure, similar biochemistry, is really a better argument that we have the same designer. Similarities are proof you have the same loving biblical creator. I drive a Ford pickup truck. My next door neighbor has a Ford van and their dashboards are identical. <laughs> it's not because they evolved from a skateboard. <laughs> it's because they have the same designer, right? Absolutely. Similarities are proof of a similar designer. So in case you think it's just me saying that they've got no evidence, Actually, back in about 1930, Richard Goldschmidt came up with the hopeful monster theory to explain why they have no evidence. And he said, well, maybe reptiles laid eggs and birds popped out, leaving no evidence behind. Well, most people were laughing at the hopeful monster theory. So 50 years later, around 1980, world-famous evolutionists Niles Eldridge and Stephen Gould of Harvard changed hopeful monster just slightly, but they came up with, they gave it a better sounding name, Punctuated equilibrium. This is now a key concept for Darwinian evolutionism. If a kid asks a professor, well, why is there no evidence in the fossil record? He's going to say, punctuated equilibrium. Don't you know anything? Well, what that means, by the way, is evolution didn't just happen overnight, but it happened in a short spurt of time, and then there's a long period with no change. They call it stasis. And then a period of fast evolution and a long period with no change. So no evidence was captured in the fossil record. It's not just me saying they've got no evidence. They've got a theory to explain when they've got what? No evidence. They've got no evidence. I thought science was knowledge derived from the study of the evidence. Darwinism isn't science, and neither is millions of years' beliefs. They're both beliefs. You might be thinking, oh, come on, Russ, what about the ape men? I mean, we've all been showed the hominids, the closest link between ape and man, right? 
Let's take a look at some of the famous hominids. Here's a, here's a modern textbook showing humans related to jellyfish and worms connected by a nice red line. What more could you want than a nice red line? And, you know, I can sit here, and, and, and when we're just talking about this, it starts to look kind of silly, doesn't it? But if you're a student in school, and you've gone home and read the book, and you sit in class, and you're told, look, this is the evolution proof, you're not going to be thinking this is silly. You're going to most likely accept it. And you're going to be one of those 85% that leave the church by the age of 20. Piltdown Man was the messiah of evolution from about 1912 to the mid-1950s for 45 years. This was actually, this uh, Piltdown Man was probably the number one reason we eventually kicked creation and prayer out of our schools and started teaching our future citizens they evolved without God because it changed so many people's thinking over that 45-year period. And then finally, in uh, about 1955, it was discovered these jokers had taken the skull cap of a human, the jawbone from an orangutan, fouled them down to fit together, acid treated both sides, and buried them in a rock quarry in Piltdown, England. Came along two years later, dug up Piltdown Man, and spent the rest of their lives as world renowned evolutionists, speaking wherever they wanted to speak. And misled not millions, billions of people and to rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, based on a total fraud. Nebraska man was used as proof for Darwinism. All they found in Nebraska man back in the 1920s was a piece of a broken tooth. But they got pretty creative. From the broken tooth, they reconstructed Nebraska man, his family, even the tools they would have worked with. From a piece of a broken tooth. It was later proven that tooth came from an extinct peccary. Extinct pig. There's a real Nebraska man right there. <laughs> so in 1932, they found a crushed lower jawbone. It was crushed in about 40 pieces. It had all apes' teeth. But they reconstructed those 40 pieces, and lo and behold, it came out in the shape of a human jawbone with all apes' teeth, and thus was born Ramapithecus, the missing link. And into textbooks again for 45 years went Ramapithecus, teaching kids they evolved without God. And then in 1977, it was proven that was actually the jawbone from an orangutan. After misleading hundreds of millions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So a kid studying to be a dentist hands me his advanced biology book from dental school. And he says, hey, Russ, look through my book, pick out some frauds. Hey, we could be here for a week going through the frauds. You're, when you leave here today, I'm not going to cover every fraud. There's too many. You're going to have to be able to stand on your own and say, if this goes against the word of God, I'm putting my faith in the word of God. You can't put your faith in these things. It's sad, but it's just the way it is. Put your faith in the word of God. So I'm, I'm just flipping through the book while he's talking to me, and there's the drawing of Ramapithecus' teeth. So that caught my eye because it was proven to be an orangutan 35-plus years ago. Well, now they put it back into the modern advanced biology books with the new name. It's called Civipithecus. And it says this genus now includes the animal formerly known as Ramapithecus. That's proven to be an orangutan 35 years ago, and now he's branched off into ancestors. Anyways, the author of the book somehow someone told, told on me for pointing this out, and so they called me and they were going to sue me. I said, what are you going to sue me for? You're making fun of me. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just showing you what, people what you put in your book. I said, take it out of the book. I won't talk about it anymore. Anyway, she hasn't, she hasn't sued me yet. That was two years ago. So. so now this has been the Messiah for evolution since about 1974. This is Lucy. And these were the bones originally found with Lucy, about 30% of a skeleton. And they said, look, we know it's an ape becoming human because the femur, the thigh bone, angles to the knee. And human thigh bones angle to the knee. They, they said that proves it's an ape becoming human. They forgot to mention that almost all tree-dwelling apes have angle femurs. They said, but the knee joint is, think about this, slightly bigger than a normal ape's knee. My friends, if you took every knee joint in this room, they'd be different sizes. There's no proof of evolution there. They also forgot to point out that the knee joint in question was found over a mile away and 230 feet deeper in the strata. Yeah, if that was Lucy's knee, I want to see the airplane that hit that monkey. Because he must have been going about 700 miles an hour right through the treetops, right? 
Now, other such fossils have been found since. Australopithecus afarensis is a scientific name. They have curved toes and fingers for grabbing onto tree limbs. This from 30 years ago. Anatomists have concluded these creatures are not a link between ape and man and did not walk upright like a human. Yet here's a new textbook showing Lucy walking perfectly upright like a human, talking on a cell phone. <laughs> I don't get it. So Tomei Man is one of the new messiahs now. It's in the, the new books. Uh, they say it's older than any hominone ever found before. You ever notice how it's always got to be the oldest or the youngest to get grant money? Yeah. Well, anyways, so uh, when they actually found this in 2002, Nature Magazine said this is just an ape. When they found it in 2002, Science News reported that the teeth are apes. It didn't walk on two legs. They knew it was an ape when they found it. They wait 10 years and put it in the textbooks as the new missing link, the closest link between ape and man. This uh, Yale professor of anthropology said that human evolution theories reveal more about how humans view themselves than it does about how humans came about. If you want to believe you evolved from a wet rock, that is your belief. But stop teaching it in our schools as if it were science. You know, think about it logically, with millions of individual apes and monkeys having lived and died over the last 500 years alone, why does finding a monkey bone prove evolution? Doesn't it just prove that when monkeys die, they leave their bones behind? <laughs> Dwayne Gish defined uh, Darwinism as a sustenance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links unseen. <laughs> Yeah, here's a new textbook showing kids humans related all sorts of apes and primates by nice colorful lines. Like the tarsier. We're related to the tarsier? <laughs> Grandma, what big eyes you've got. The better to see you with. Malcolm Muggeridge stated the theory of evolution will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could have been accepted. But my friends, it's being accepted because it's being taught in our secular schools as if it were science, and it's not science. It's a religious belief. Professing themselves to be wise, they've been fooled, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And again, these verses are talking about idolatry. And what we're being told is the highest form of idolatry is to think you evolved, you're your own God. That was the original sin in, in the Garden of Eden, right? Eat of the tree, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God. Nothing ever changes. But a review of Darwinism versus actual observable empirical science will show us that the law of biogenesis has never been overcome. Darwinism couldn't have started. Mathematical probability says it never happened. The fossil record shows no missing links that will hold up to true scientific scrutiny. We don't have any half this, half that flopping around on earth today, do we? No. And my friends, it's not because of hopeful monsters. And it's not because of punctuated equilibrium. And it's not because the evidence got lost in the iffy stuff. It's because gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. And real science is a believer's true friend. Real science. But billions of years in Darwinism is simply humanistic indoctrination which has undermined scientific research scientific education, and the saving faith of billions of people around the globe. And 85% of our kids are leaving the church by the age of 20 today. We need to get this information to them. The calling of this ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues, to expose false anti-biblical teachings, thusly providing a reason for the hope that's in the heart of every true believer and every true seeker. We do this through our various teachings, like the Age of the Earth issues, Noah's Ark and Dinosaurs, one of our best Sunday service messages. Um, in fact, I'm giving that, I believe, tomorrow morning. If you have any friends in Camp Verde, I'll be giving the service messages at Calvary Chapel, Camp Verde, tomorrow morning. Ask them to come and 
see the information. It's eye-opening. We do this through our DVDs. We've got our singles. Our singles have two or three teachings on each one. They're all in our DVD sets, and I do not copyright my DVDs because the only way to get this out there is for you to get them and make copies and give away. I spoke in, in Grand Oregon a year and a half ago, and one woman got our DVD set, went out and bought a tower copier, and she has given away 250 plus complete sets of our DVDs. It's even getting into the, to the public school systems now. Ten different churches there have had us come up and speak because this information is really starting to impact the whole area. You guys can do the same thing. If, you want, if you're looking for a ministry, you're looking for a way to serve God, easy thing to do, give someone some of these DVDs. Here, watch this, or watch that. And easy to watch that. Darwinism, watch this. You can do it. We can make a difference. Check out our kids' coloring books on America's Christian heritage and Noah's Ark and dinosaurs. It spells out the biblical foundations. You know, for that, on that ark, God gave us one narrow plank way that led through one door, his plan of salvation. Today, he's given us one narrow pathway that leads through one door. And it's not my plan, and it's not your plan or that person's plan. It's God's plan. It's God's one way. That door is Jesus Christ. And my new book, It's About Time. Because, my friends, by learning real science, we can chop down the thorn bush of false science, known as billions of years leading to a Darwinian process. Then the soil is ready for the planting of the seed. God's word. Plow up the soil. Plant the seed. Let's reap a bountiful harvest and save souls for the glory of our Lord and Creator, Jesus Christ. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. And again, I thank you for every dear soul that's here and the leadership here that have put this uh, forum together. I thank you for all the speakers that are here today, and I just hope and I pray the information all of us share will be eye-opening, faith-strengthening, and encouraging everyone to get out and contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I ask this in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.